بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم ویورز آئی ایم یور ہوسٹ ایس ایم حالی ود انادر ایڈیشن آف ڈیفینس اینڈ ڈپلومیسی دا ریجن وی لیو ان دیر از نیور اے ڈل مومنٹ دیر آر اے نمبر آف ڈیولپمنٹس ٹیکنگ پلیس اینڈ دا لیٹسٹ از دی نان الائن موومنٹ سمٹ کانفرنس وچ از ٹیکنگ پلیس رائٹ ناؤ ان تہران اینڈ ایف ٹائم پرمٹس وی ووڈ آلسو لائک ٹو ڈسکس دی سیکنڈ ڈیولپمنٹ وچ ٹو پلیس دس ویک واز the formulation of a committee to look into Dr. Afia Siddiqui's case. But before I ramble on, I would like to introduce our very eminent guests today. We are honored to have in the studio Ambassador Khalid Mahmood, who is a renowned diplomat and is continuing with his analysis as well as inputs into diplomacy. How do you do, sir? Thank you. And we have with us Farooq Khan Petafi, who is a renowned analyst, columnist, and also a TV show host. Welcome. Thank you. So for the sake of our younger viewers, if you could give us just a very brief introduction to the NAM. See, NAM stands for Non-Aligned Movement. It uh, emerged during the heydays of the Cold War in the 50s. Uh, initial uh, meeting which you can say which were precursors to the establishment of this movement uh, took place in Colombo and uh, probably and in the year 1961 sir? no no the even 50s, before that yeah okay in 55 the Bandung conference mm -hmm. so the f philosophical uh, underpinnings of this uh, movement uh, they were uh, finalized uh, you know at that place and it was uh, the and there, you know, as you know, this uh, five principles of uh, peaceful coexistence, Panchila. they, Panchila, you know, they emerged from there. And they provided the main uh, uh, framework uh, uh, within which the uh, non-aligned movement later on uh, developed, you know. But the first conference of the heads of state and governments of these non-aligned countries took place in 1961 in uh, Yugoslavia, Belgrade, uh, because uh, the leadership role in the development of uh, this movement was uh, undertaken by uh, Marshal Tito. Tito of Yugoslavia, Na Nehru of uh, India, Sukarno of uh, Indonesia. The Cubans, of and, course. No, not at that time, Cuba. Then uh, Nkrumah of Ghana. Okay. So these were the five, uh, you know, uh, leaders uh, and they, their thinking was that uh, the world is divided between two uh, opposing blocks led by United States and the uh, Soviet Union and they are piling up uh, armaments and uh, there's a lot of tension uh, between these two blocks everywhere in the world you know and there's likelihood there could be even war break out uh, and uh, between them and uh, given the the you know, arm, arm, arms which they have amassed, you know, it would be very catastrophic for uh, the whole world. So they said uh, we new countries which were newly emerging uh, from the yoke of uh, colonialism, you know, they said we will be uh, willingly or unwillingly caught up in this uh, uh, fight among the, these uh, big powers and uh, we should not align ourselves or not even align against uh, any of uh, these two super blocks. And remain neutral. And remain neutral. Uh, but uh, this word is a little bit misconstrued because uh, neutral, there were other countries also neutral like Sweden, Austria, but that is a different meaning. Here what they meant was that uh, we should not toe the line of either of these blocks and think of our own interests. And if those happen, uh, interests have aligned with one group, then we should s support that group. But we should take our own independent decision. But this was the philosophical, you know, just uh, orientation, uh, of orientation of this uh, uh, movement. This is not an organization, it is a movement. Right. It doesn't have any uh, structure, you know, or uh, <coughs> secretariat, you know, permanent, uh, all these things. But uh, in practice, you know, many of these countries were inactually aligned. 
Uh, right. Think of uh, right. right from uh, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia, <laughs> right? Even in India, even in India, there is a Soviet bloc and or Cuba. You know, all right. these countries had orientation, but the overall thrust of this move, movement became anti-West, anti-US. And so, uh, if, 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 if you hold that thought, Farooq, the sir. question that arises in the sir. minds of uh, most of our viewers is sir. that this, as the ambassador very eloquently pointed out, that it was focused in the uh -huh. era of the Cold War. Sir. The Cold War is long gone, especially with the dissipation of uh, USSR. So, yeah. so uh, what is its focus now, and is it uh, still a, a body which has uh, uh, any teeth? Well, well, this is very interesting. Whether it had teeth in the past or not, that is a big question, even, even today. But today, uh, a, a lot of people have tried to or have been challenging its relevance. The important thing is that what are the ma ma major focus points of this organization or movement, as uh, Ambassador Saab uh, calls it. Uh, you know, the uh, one major is uh, disarmament, counterterrorism, economic uh, reforms. Uh, all these things are relevant today also. Uh, especially when you have a unipolar world, you have to realize that uh, every, every country cannot stay aligned to that uh, one uh, center of power. So the basic principle still remains intact, and that is very important. Uh, the, the question is, what exactly are we going to expect uh, from this, uh, uh, this summit that is, going to take, uh, that is taking fact, place even begun. right now? Yeah. Um, important thing is that you have to see that uh, Iran today, which is uh, hosting the event, is a highly sanctioned country. It is highly as isolated. Then we have Syrian uh, you know, civil war. Uh, Pakistan and India, uh, my leader of Pakistan and India will also be meeting on the sidelines. The so Palestine question. The Palestine, uh, the Palestine question has been there for quite some time. No, but it is one of the major uh, issues to be discussed in uh, this. It, it is, it, it has been, but I don't know whether we are going to have some headway over there or not. The, the important thing at this moment, I, as I see it, is uh, Syrian civil war, Pakistan, India, uh, peace talks, that, that, that is a major concern for us. And then, of course, Iran's isolation. Mahathir Mohammed of Indonesia actually said something very interesting. He said that uh, the, the principles, Panchil principles that uh, Ambassador was talking about, one of them is that uh, uh, every country will respect the other country's uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. A lot of countries are actually part of NAM who are sanctioning um, uh, Iran, despite the fact that uh, the UN has not sanctioned the country as yet. The, these are very important points. Uh, perhaps uh, some solution can be found out. But if you talk about Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's focus. I, I'll, I'll just get back to Pakistan's sir. focus. Sir. I just wanted to ask the ambassador, sir. A very important uh, event which is taking place because of this NAM is that Tehran, the host, and the former custodian of NAM, Egypt, were not enjoying diplomatic relations. In fact, uh, they were not on speaking terms, especially since the uh, Egyptians established relations with Israel. And also when uh, Egypt gave uh, a space for the former Shah of Iran to be buried over there. But now we find that the Egyptian President Morsi has flown into Tehran, is handing over the custodianship. How do you look at it, sir? See, as uh, was pointed out that uh, uh, NAM, uh, uh, the context in which it was uh, started, it has completely changed. You know that uh, Cold War has been replaced by uh, unipolarity, uh, and uh, the focus of now NAM, uh, it is not uh, uh, not taking side, but how to uh, resist the pressures from this. Uh, uh, single, single block, you know, headed by the United States. This is one. And uh, secondly, more focus now of the developing world, which are uh, represented in uh, NAM, is uh, the economic problems, you know, of development to how to alleviate poverty. So this is, this, this is the focus has uh, shifted to this. Now, about this particular question you have asked about the Egyptian president coming here, there are two uh, angles to it. One is that uh, Egypt was uh, the f outgoing president, chairman of this movement, so it has to hand over 
the chairmanship to the new incoming chairman uh, that is Iran. That is the technical side. But uh, visit of uh, President of Egypt to Iran after, since 1979, no president has visited, uh, or I mean, there have been no relation between the uh, two okay. countries, you know. Okay. So the very fact that uh, the uh, Egyptian president will be visiting uh, Iran for this purpose, though, uh, that carries some significance. And it is uh, uh, particularly significant that uh, this is being done in the teeth of the opposition from the uh, United States. Because the United States has let it be known that uh, the countries should uh, uh, avoid uh, you know, this in, summit. In, in, in fact, uh, the UN uh, Secretary, Secretary General, General Ban Ki-moon was, was pressurized by both Israel and the United States not to participate, but he is there. Yeah. He is uh, very much there for the last uh, 24 hours or yeah. so. Yeah. So that is also indicative of that. So now, uh, the visit of uh, President Morsi reflects the change in Egypt, well, or in fact in the rest of the Arab world. Exactly, exactly. That exactly. Uh, from uh, the, the rulers which were overtly pro-West, like Mubarak and uh, Abedin and Tunis, you know, they have been replaced by a new breed of uh, uh, leaders who are um, uh, no longer tied to the aprons of uh, uh, West or United States. So this is one way of asserting their independent, uh, independent thinking. thinking uh, yeah. And, and, and then remember, sir, that this is beauty of diplomacy and beauty of such bodies also, that a lot of countries that have been at loggerheads come together and they, they actually build peace. This is the example. India-Pakistan being another example. In fact, you were talking about yeah. uh, Pakistan. May I ask you, sir. Pakistan is being represented by mm -hmm. uh, President Zardari and sir. our Foreign Minister Hinara Bani Khar. Mm -hmm. And HRK made quite an impressive uh, speech the other day she highlighted uh -huh. that uh, the Iranian problem must be resolved with dialogue sure. and sure. so on but uh, do you think there is a chance of the president meeting the Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, of there's India? a big chance there's of course a and chance and it, it has been tipped uh, uh, there, there were uh, early indication that this is going to take place secondly remember there's another context as well uh, next month, Indian Minister of External Affairs is coming to Pakistan. So we are already uh, building peace, and we are working on that kind of, uh, the peace that is that has also already the process has already started. That uh, ha having said that, I I just wanted to point out a, a couple of other things as well. Pakistani diplomacy, uh, unfortunately, has been a bit naive. We have never learned the art of making new friends without... You say uh, in the presence uh, of a very seasoned diplomat. No, no, I know that, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not talking about uh, the, uh, the, present, the present company ex uh, exempted. But I wanted to say, say one thing, that Pakistan's foreign office or Pakistan as a country has not been able to uh, go for a, a kind of diplomacy that is needed. And that is making new friends without annoying the old ones. This is very important. Pakistan isn't a superpower. Pakistan is emerging uh, economy. Pakistan is a de de developing country. We have to remember that we, we have to take uh, care of other concerns in the region as well. We have to take uh, care uh, of uh, the U.S. interest and our relation with the U.S. as well. So somehow uh, it is important for us right now to, to, to build bridges with our other countries but never become hostage to any country's rival, uh, rivalry with any, any other country. Exactly. This is very important. Make new friends, but keep the old, yeah. the, the new are silver, exactly. the old are gold. Exactly. The exactly. Same. Uh, Israel's concerns might be different. Pakistan has no diplomatic relations with Israel. But when it comes to uh, the U.S., when it comes to the entire region, there are countries which are not comfortable with each other. We have to take care that we don't alienate any of them. And it is important that Pakistan's focus either should be uh, uh, should remain on disarmament, conflict resolution, all these issues, or then, of course, working on uh, building bridges with other countries, including India. Right. Point taken. Ambassador, you have served uh, as the head of Pakistan's mission in uh, Tehran as well as in Riyadh, in Beijing, and you have served for many years at the United Nations also. So you are in a very good position to comment on this. Uh, how do you see this particular summit, and especially do you think Tehran will be able to come out of this isolation it has been pushed in? I think uh, whatever result of this uh, summit might be, but I think the greatest gainer is 
Iran. Iran, of course, it is. Because, uh, as, as, as is well known, that uh, unfortunately uh, Iran is uh, isolated due to the pressure tactics uh, of the United States and the West. It is under the heaviest sanctions at the present moment. Ordinarily, one would not have expected uh, that uh, so many countries and that too at the head of state and government level would attend this uh, summit because the uh, United States had uh, let it known that uh, it does not approve of uh, such participation. But the very fact that uh, the countries have ignored U.S. pressure and have uh, congregated at uh, uh, Tehran, Tehran uh, it uh, uh, reflects the success of Iran in uh, defying um, American uh, pressure. And, uh, but what do you say of uh, Iranian diplomacy, which uh, so far has avoided controversy? Of course, there are reverberations that Iran, and as uh, he mentioned, about Iran's sovereignty uh, being disturbed. But uh, Iran so far has avoided any hard talk. Yeah. So this is one you know, part. But, it, uh, but other is about... Has it avoided hard talk? So sorry to cut you. Important thing is the venue of this summit is, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, adjacent to this venue uh, are the remains of the three, three uh, you know, engineers who were killed. Yes, but, the that's scientists. A, but that's a very subtle way of doing it. They have, they have kept the wreckage of the three cars the wreckage, yeah, in which they were shot. And also in the entrance, there are photographs, you know, but highlighting... Th what message are you giving, actually? that uh, not only Iran is a victim of the uh, Western, uh, you know, terrorism, but West is actively working against us and you have to come and stand with us. This is, this is where the problem is. We have to understand, uh, Iran is good diplomatically. It is a very strong country. It can take care of itself. The important thing is every country that has gone there has to take care of its own interests, not Iran's. And as long as that is remembered, I think everything is going to be okay. Con avoiding controversy, Iran has not been able to avoid controversies. It is building up a, uh, a narrative. But Pakistan can, of course, uh, avoid as many c controversies as possible. And Pakistan, of course, sir, has a lot to gain because Iran is not only our next door neighbor. Please remember, sir, that uh, Iran was the first country which recognized Pakistan when we became independent. We have had a tremendous relationship and for the future also. The Pakistan-Iran gas pipeline coming up and so many other things. We need to have the correct posture. Yeah. You see, we have to go by principles. Now, this is one was the perception that uh, Iran is isolated country. That perception is being removed by this conference to a certain extent. The other is on the substantive part about the Iran's nuclear program and uh, stance of the United States and various other countries, particularly among the Arab world, that uh, how they view it. So, so you mentioned the uh, nuclear issue. Ban Ki-moon, in his very first address in Tehran, he mentioned two problems. One, the uh, nuclear issue. And the second, he mentioned, was the alleged Iranian human rights issue. Yes. So all these, I think, now issues will be uh, in the forefront of the discussions there. But you will see that uh, the final uh, declaration which will come out will be, in my view, supportive of the Iranian positions because Iranian position is based on certain principles. For example, about the nuclear program, because Iran says that uh, as party to the non-proliferation treaty, they have right to the peaceful uses of atomic energy and their program is peaceful. Of course, the there's a counter narrative saying, no, the program is not peaceful. But IAEA, although it has given some reports which could be interpreted as uh, implicating. implicating Iran, but it has not categorically determined that Iran's program is uh, weapon oriented. So on principles, Iran is uh, right that uh, we have the right to, to peaceful exploitation of uh, atomic energy. Now, secondly, against non-interference. Now, this is one of the main uh, plank of uh, non-aligned, that the countries should not interfere in the other countries' affairs. affairs. Okay. And uh, thirdly, that uh, there should be no coercion. Now, sanctions is a coercive measures which have been taken against uh, uh, Iran. Uh, so on these th 
things, you will see that the, uh, if, if the movement is faithful to its original uh, principles, it will come out with declaration which will be supporting Iran on this principle positions. Well, well uh, to, to be honest, I don't see it taking that kind of a stride. Earlier, Amb Ambassador Saab himself said something that was interesting. He said that, of course, uh, even though it was called NAM, it was not hard and fast uh, uh, non-aligned movement. There were countries which were aligned. Important thing and, is you have to remember. Pakistan had a very difficult time becoming a member because we were opposed having been perceived yeah. as an aligned country. Of course, CETO and CENTO and everything. Mm. Uh, but, but important thing is at this moment, uh, Ambassador Saab and you were hinting at actually uh, the human right abuses in Iran. And then the fact that a narrative has been built against the nuclear uh, ambition of Iran itself. Uh, important thing is this narrative was started by the Iranian opposition, not by the U.S. They gave uh, presentations uh, to the Americans and their intelligence community, and after that everything right. was planned. Okay. Uh, uh, important thing is that you have to remember that even today when, uh, when we speak, there are major human rights issues in Iran, and because of that there is uh, a constituency which might be trying to implicate uh, the country. And, and I don't really see that NAM will be actually standing steadfastly with the Iran on these matters. I think a major important issue is of the disarmament uh, in the year 2025. They will be focusing more on that. Talking about human rights so, issues, uh, Ambassador, if you recall, in my opening, I said that if time permits, we'll talk about Dr. Afia Siddiqui, and this is perceived to be a human rights issue. Dr. Afia Siddiqui, a highly qualified uh, uh, student who happened to have leanings towards Islam, ends up on the wrong side of the law, and of course her plight is very well known, how she ended up in Bagram, and then she has been tried and sentenced to 86 years, and is now being incarcerated in Caswell, Texas. Uh, but the Prime Minister of Pakistan, only the other day, after the visit of uh, Ramsey Clark, the former U.S. Attorney General, has appointed a four-member committee headed by Hina Rabanikar, and its members are the Ministers for Interior, the Minister for Human Rights, uh, and the Minister for Law. How do you see this development, sir? See, this is indeed a very tragic case, and uh, it defies the comprehension that how a frail lady has been convicted of uh, attacking uh, American armed soldiers and uh, also sentenced for uh, attempt to murder them. But whatever may be the case, but the fact is that she has been now sentenced. And the sentence is about 86 years, you know, such harsh sentence. Uh, so uh, there is a human cry, you know, that uh, uh, perhaps uh, she has not uh, received a very fair uh, treatment and trial. Uh, so we cannot comment on this. But uh, this is the perception which persists, you know, particularly so, in so Pakistan. This committee so, will help. So uh, people have been uh, urging the government to take some proactive action to uh, get uh, Afia repatriated to. But the uh, government Pakistan. it says that it spent something like uh, two billion uh, dollars. About the legal, uh, you know, legal, the legal aid for uh, the fees of the lawyers during trial. Uh, two right. million dollars, government of Pakistan. If you permit, yeah. let me ask Farrokh. Mm -hmm. There is a perception. Sure. I mean, initially when Raymond Davis was uh, arrested that mm -hmm. there may be a swap over, it didn't happen. Okay. Now there is a perception that maybe uh, there is an effort to swap uh, Afia with the Dr. Shakil Afridi. Mm -hmm. How do you look at that? Well, well, first of all, I must say, say that the government's, uh, this forming of this committee is quite commendable. Uh, the government has been proactive, uh, Ambassador Saab might uh, disagree, but I think it has been very uh, proactive on this case. Important thing is that there, there are a lot of question marks on the entire story, and they have not been cleared. Who she was, whether she is a Pakistani citizen or not, whether she she was really uh, that innocent, that has not been cleared thus far. It is important that such a body will also be able to clear all these things because there, there are so many um, uh, you know uh, blanks in it in the story that have to be cleared. Again, uh, now human uh, rights. I, I'm coming Shakil to the Afridi. end of the program. You need to find uh, um, uh, it up. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. 
they, they are, they can't be two standards of human rights. Important thing is, we should be fighting for Afia Siddiqui and she should be brought back. But uh, any Rimsha in Pakistan should also be treated as such because they are, she is also a daughter of Pakistan and Shakila Fridi. Uh, again, uh, that is a big question mark. We don't know what exactly did he do. Till the time we don't know it, uh, whether he aided or abetted the U.S. or whether he aided or abetted any terrorist groups in Pakistan, how can we offer such a person to any other foreign country? The, the important thing is that we have okay. to bring all the uh, loose ends together and we have to tie them. So, viewers, with that, we come to the end of this program and both our participants are of the opinion that non-aligned movement may be out of context as far as the Cold War is concerned, but the basic principles on which it was formed, they continue. And a movement like this is pertinent, especially because it has 120 members, which is just next to the United Nations. Therefore, it is a force to reckon with. The important thing is that it has to stick to its original principles. Only then it will make its voice heard. And as far as Dr. Afia Siddiqui is concerned, it has been brought out that yes, there are loose ends, they need to be looked into, and Dr. Afia Siddiqui's case must be looked at with sympathy, and if she is innocent, she must be absolved of the charges and brought back home so that she can live the rest of her life in peace. With that, we end this program, but before that, I would like to thank you, Ambassador, for your very cogent comments, and Farrokh Petafi for your you. very kind comments. Viewers, keep watching us and hope to see you next week, inshallah. Allah Hafiz.